join me in welcoming Michael to the stage. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Michael Hoffman, a partner of Object Theory. Um, before that, I was actually a principal lead on the actual Microsoft uh, HoloLens team and uh, founded Object Theory to build HoloLens solutions for the enterprise. So um, we actually um, plan strategy and build enterprise solutions for our clients. So that was us. So um, I want to talk today about um, one of our clients, CDM Smith. CDM Smith is um, one of the leading consulting firms in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry, also known as AEC. CDM Smith builds enormous infrastructure projects, like this wastewater treatment facility, uh, highway interchanges, and dams. So let's start with a brief introduction. CDM Smith has been innovating with clients to provide safe and reliable infrastructure for 70 years. We provide solutions in water, environment, transportation, energy and facilities to public and private clients around the globe. As a full service engineering and construction firm, we team with clients to bring projects from inception through completion. We were one of the first firms in the industry to provide integrated design build projects and we are excited to define the future of infrastructure project delivery with virtual design and construction enabled by mixed reality. Three-dimensional modeling in BIM have been powerful tools for our industry, but they are still being presented as a model through a two-dimensional screen. Applying these models with mixed reality lets you experience them as 3D objects at scale. This enhances collaboration across the project lifecycle by enabling remote team members to experience the project. It also improves decision making and resolves questions faster by enabling everyone to experience what-if scenarios in the context of a physical environment. Design and constructability issues can be resolved in real time. Visualizing digital content as holograms in the context of the physical world bridges the gap between virtual and real and eliminates some of the current workflow's inefficiencies. Mixed reality also presents the opportunity for an infinite environment in which data such as schedule, specifications, and simulation can be overlaid onto the world, creating a hyper-reality environment. So over the past year, we've been um, helping CDM Smith solve some of the tough challenges that they face in the AEC industry. Um, one of the biggest challenges they face is collaboration between the engineers who have actually designed some of these big infrastructure projects and the construction crew that's out there actually building it. Um, the actual engineers are typically geographically dispersed across many different CDM Smith offices, and uh, they often are uh, offering specialized skills that mean that they're working on multiple projects at once. So it's not really conceivable to have them on site at a construction site in any meaningful capacity. So pretty much everything that happens, happens via traditional 2D communications mediums like Skype and screen sharing, and there's a lot of um, error-prone um, communications potential in that, and uh, so they're trying to reduce their errors in those collaborations between the engineers and the construction crew. So in our collaboration solution, we were inspired by some of the avatars that were created on, on the uh, Microsoft HoloLens team, including some of the partnerships with uh, NASA, Trimble, and Autodesk. Those are all um, so solutions that I actually was actively participant in, in creating at Microsoft. Um, so our solutions are basically similar to those um, solutions in the sense that they were inspired by the collaboration capacity of like the Mars uh, mission planning. And what we do is we actually bring an avatar for every single remote collaborator into the room with you. And so everybody that's not present is basically brought into the room in a way that they actually feel like they're present in the conversation with you. And you're having a conversation around actual three-dimensional geometry. So it actually is very empowering for creating a collaborative solution around something that's 3D in nature. And another key point is that, unlike screen sharing, nobody has to be the host. You can have an equal conversation between all participants where no one person is actually driving the conversation. So the first thing we set out to do is come up with what our key objectives are for avatars. 
Um, one of the biggest things is that our avatars are actually a business tool. So from our perspective, they actually have to serve a valuable business purpose. Otherwise, we shouldn't even have avatars in our solution. So we had to try to figure out what that was. Um, so one of the things that we decided to do was come up with a list of criteria for our avatars. The first thing is that they have to be human. That each, each avatar is representing a human, nothing else makes sense. There are plenty of avatars in the world that represent other things like uh, dinosaurs and, and other things in movies and games. Um, so the other is benevolent. It's actually incredibly difficult to create a human form at HoloLens full scale size and have it not be a little bit creepy or eerie or imposing. So that was actually more of a challenge than we thought it would be. Um, the other is um, neutral in appearance. We decided to completely avoid um, introducing gender and race, so that was actually a design decision. And, uh, but yet, they have to be distinguishable, so we had to come up with ways of distinguishing the avatars despite the fact that they're neutral. And finally, they have to be informative and give you all the possible information that they can to contribute information to the conversation. So why are business avatars not the same as a game avatar? Um, there are really, really good avatars out there, like these Xbox Live avatars. They're highly customizable. They have a lot of animation and poses that you can even do things like smile and wink. And, and uh, it's just amazing how much has gone into creating really interesting avatars. Um, that said, they're conceptually similar, but they're very different than what we are trying to achieve. Um, so the big, oh, back one. Um, so the biggest thing is that uh, there's, well, there's three primary differences. One is that um, our avatars are basically um, being used for business tools. The other is we're gonna, you're going to see them at life size, and at life size, they actually are very different in, in the way you experience it than a game character on a screen. And then the other is that um, there's a triangle count or polygon count considerations. These avatars are very compute intensive, and we had to think about how to make them less compute intensive. So what have we learned about creating avatars? Well, we're gonna cover three big areas of learnings around avatars. Um, that is appearance, which is how they appear. Gaze, which is taking advantage of something the HoloLens offers, which is where the person's head is pointing. And motion, the motion of avatars actually can be quite complex. So let's start with appearance. So the only information we actually have from a HoloLens is where your head is pointing. That's the only information we had. So we started off with this the, just the head, and it was a really low triangle count, and it just didn't play well. It looked really weird. You had this disembodied head that's out there in space, and it just didn't work very well. So then we thought, okay, well, let's at least add a torso and arms, and if you look at that, you can already tell just even on 2D that it just wasn't really easy to create a human-like form with so few triangles. It just didn't play very well. So we finally just bit the bullet and said, okay, we have to use a lot of more of our polygon count uh, budget and add a lot of detail to the human form. Well, the challenge with this is now you're thinking in terms of what are the eye shape, what are the ear shape, what are the mouth shape? And all of a sudden, you start realizing that you're heading into the uncanny valley because it's, you're trying to make it really human, and yet it's really hard to make something look human before it just starts being really creepy. And especially, again, at life size. I mean, this thing is huge in front of you. It's a six foot tall avatar in front of you. Um, so anybody who doesn't know the Uncanny Valley, it's this uncomfortable place between the obviously fake and the obviously real. And right in the between there, it gets really dangerous. And we had headed right in there. Um, Wally on the left, totally fake. Like, you do not think of it as being a human, and it has endearing human traits, right? It's a, it's a character, but you never, you never confuse it with a human. The creepy robot on the right, very creepy. It is trying so hard to be human, and yet you just absolutely know that it's not. So we decided we had to get out of the uncanny valley. So what we did is we backed off on, not necessarily on triangle count, but we backed off on trying to create really defined facial features. And one of the big breakthroughs we had was that um, we created this kind of outline glow to it and that outline glow from any angle gives you sort of that cartoon-like appearance and it really ended up playing well and we're really happy with where we landed. It's a work in progress. We've actually improved a little bit on this one since uh, that slide was made. Okay, so the next thing we have to do 
is how do you make them distinguishable? Well, we gave each one a name tag. Well, it kind of makes sense. You just have a name tag, you know who's who. But the problem is with a HoloLens, you're constantly trying to find the name tags. And it's really hard to find all those name tags. And it just didn't work really well. So we thought, okay, well, let's color code them. Like, so Michael is Michael is blue, Jane is red. And, and the problem with that, of course, is I don't remember who's blue and who's yellow. Like, what is, it doesn't mean anything. Um, so then we thought, we just, one, one of our devs just threw in like hats and glasses. And we're like, oh my God, hats and glasses, like that's brilliant. And it turns out that we kept adding more and more of what we call flair. And it was really brilliant because the, the, it really helped you know the role of the person. So you could really understand something truly about the trade of the person. That fedora is in there because I actually wear a fedora. And they said, okay, well, we'll put a fedora in. And, and of course, I'm always wearing the fedora because it just is part of who I am as a person. And everybody knows that. So it actually played really well. Um, so that, this is basically where we landed. Um, again, things have improved even a little from there because it's a work in progress. Um, so that's it for appearance. So let's move on to gaze. I have to keep moving fast because I got so much to cover. Um, so gaze is a feature of the HoloLens. The HoloLens tells you, or tells the software, where you're looking. And it's used a lot in HoloLens to select things, to let you know what's going on, or let you um, know what you're looking at. And so we knew that we could take advantage of that to solve some of these industry challenges. So one of the big challenges that CDM Smith faces is in these 2D communications, they're doing things like, okay, in that blueprint, do you see that column in the upper left-hand corner? Yeah, yeah, I think I do. No, 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 the one to the left of that one. And it's like, you have the, and, and this is coming from our client. Our client is saying, we have these calls all the time. And you just pray that the construction crew is understanding what the engineers are talking about. Because if they make a mistake, it's costing thousands, 10,000, sometimes even more than that in a mistake. And CDM Smith pretty much always has to eat the cost of those mistakes. So, so they're looking for any way to improve the efficiency and, and reduce the errors in those communications. So, um, so we're using gaze to help with that. In a, in a shared environment, if you know what everybody else is looking at, you pretty much know what they're talking about. And it's actually really powerful. But the problem is, how do, you, how do you make a good gaze? The first thing we tried was a solid line. The problem with a solid line is it's really easy to confuse with all the lines coming from the geometry and from the CAD drawings that you're showing and everything you're seeing. Then we tried making it thin. Well, th thin lines would look different. Thin lines have a slight aliasing problem because to make them thin enough, you, they sort of started disappearing. So instead, we decided to go with um, this diffuse and dotted line, and that actually has worked really well. We haven't really had the need to reinvent anything since we came up with this, and it's actually working really well for us. So the, um, so the next challenge is, what you're looking at is the thing you're focusing on. So we had this idea of putting like a precision plumb bob to show exactly where that gaze is looking, so you can have a conversation around precisely this part of a model. The problem with that is the plumb bob is opaque and you can't see through it. So it's obstructing the very thing you're trying to look at. And imagine our conversation with six or seven avatars. You got six or seven plumb bobs going all over the place and it just doesn't, didn't play well. So we just got rid of it. We're just using gaze. Gaze works great without any plumb bob and that's where we've been at ever since. So one of the remaining challenges is what does it do with you? It does not make sense for me to be seeing my own gaze going around like this while I'm uh, in, in my experience. So, we just came up with the idea that there's a very small flashlight on anything you're looking at, and then you know what they're seeing. They're seeing your gaze at the point of that flashlight, and that worked really well as well. All right, so here's just kind of a final version just so you can get an idea of, of what that looks like. I have to say, the first time that you experience this where you're looking about an interesting object with your buddies, it is unbelievable the sense of presence you have and the sense of ability to talk about a subject matter. It's like, you can just say, hey, look at this over here, and everybody knows what you're looking at. And that, uh, the other people you're talking to can be anywhere in the world. And it just, every time we use this, I continue to just put the, put the grin on my face every single time. All right, so let's move on to motion. Running out of time here. So motion is actually just as complex as everything else. The only thing you know about is what, where the head is pointing or, or, and where it is located in space. That's all you have to work with. So one of the th first things we realized is we try to make legs and l pretend like we knew where legs were doing, but the, what if they sit down? What do you do with the legs? Like, do, do you guess between kneeling and sitting? And it just was a complete disaster. So we just decided to get rid of the legs and magic happened. It just really worked to have no legs. Your brain just fills in the legs and it actually makes it feel 
your brain buys that the legs are doing the right thing, so it actually buys that it's graceful and, and that you don't even have to do anything. So it was kind of a free way to get, um, get rid of that whole problem. So, so this is, I don't, uh, this is just in order introducing the concept that um, what it looks like for the avatars to be walking around and having a conversation. So the next thing we had to deal with is, okay, well, we know where the head is, but the body, we have no clue where it is. So we had this simple ball and socket joint that, con that connected the two. But the second you did anything weird, like look up, they just tore apart. So we realized we actually had to put some extra effort into fully rigging and creating lots of bones in the neck to make sure that the software was able to create a really nice looking neck under a lot of different circumstances. So um, the big lesson there was just you have to do the extra work of actually fully rigging the, the avatar. So, oh yeah, it is animating. So the next thing is like, a lot of this is Unity gaming technology. And Unity gaming technology, basically all the avatar positions are just coming across the network. And what the problem with that is they're only coming across maybe 10 times a second. So you see this giant avatar jumping three inches at a time. And it just was really jarring to be watching these giant six foot tall avatars jumping around. So we realized we had to do something called interpolation. And the interpolation basically says, every time I get an update of where the avatar is, we just start steering the avatar that way and hope it doesn't get there before we get another one. And then we steer it that way. And we can just keep doing that over and over again. It actually was a very simple and elegant solution. There's some room to do predictive, and that's something that we're going to do eventually, where you're sort of predicting what a human body does. But so far, we haven't had to. So the other thing is that we don't know what the body's doing. So you, the first we were doing this, like every time somebody turned the body, you would turn the, um, the head and the body together. But what we realized, if we just lag the body turn and you turn your head and then the body, that very simple thing made it very natural. And it actually created emergent behavior where it just felt really natural for jumping and nodding and things like that. But we still don't know what to do with the shrug because we don't know what your shoulders are doing. So there are certain expressions, of course, that we can't handle yet. All right, so what are our key takeaways? First of all, avoid the uncanny valley. Don't try to be too realistic because you're going to want to get away from that, that dangerous place. Um, use gaze beams. Gaze beams are an incredibly precise way of selecting and indicating intent. Fade avatars at the torso. Completely avoid the whole issue of dealing with legs. It's not worth it. Uh, rotate the head, of the head before the torso or ahead of the torso. Just gives you much more natural motion. Um, interpolate your avatar motion to handle a wide range of network latency issues. And that's it. I made it. Wow. Thank you very much.